part 6 of Ezekiel's temple. So what we're going to do this evening is to look at the priests that uh, will be officiating in the temple in the age to come. And that's going to be based primarily around Ezekiel chapter 44. Now, if you just come back with me to Ezekiel chapter 40 to start with, I don't know if you can remember, but when we looked at the buildings of the temple, we saw that there were two chambers at the sides of the gates leading into the inner court, and I've coloured them in yellow on that chart. Um, And these chambers are described for us in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 45, and they, they are relevant to the priests, as we shall see. So Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 45 It says, he said unto me, this chamber whose prospect is toward the south is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the house. And the chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord to minister unto him. And so we're introduced here to the priests that will minister in the temple. And these two chambers, the north and the south chambers, belong to the priests. Now it's important to note that according to these two verses, there are two distinct orders of priests. Okay, so in verse 45, there are the keepers of the charge of the house, And then in verse 46, there are the keepers of the charge of the altar. And these priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar, are also called the sons of Zadok. So we've got these two orders of priests here in chapter 40. And Ezekiel 44, we just come across there now, This chapter provides us with more detail regarding the identity of these two orders of priests. And we shall see that the keepers of the charge of the house are described in chapter 40, verses 10 through to 14. And the keepers of the charge of the altar in verse 15 onwards. And I think it will probably help right at the beginning to compare these two orders of priests and we put it here on a chart. So the keepers of the charge of the house, these are sometimes called the Levites and we learn from chapter 44 that these priests, Levites, went astray. They will, in the kingdom, they will minister in the sanctuary having charge at the gates and they will minister to the house. They will, verse 11, slay the sacrifices for the people and they will stand before the people to minister unto them. Verse 13 says that they will not come near to any of the holy things, nor to Yahweh. And then verse 14 tells us that they will keep the charge of the house. So that's the first order of priests, the Levites. And then the sons of Zadok, we're told, verse 15, they, historically, they kept the charge of the sanctuary. So in the kingdom, verses 15 and 16 tell us, they will enter into the sanctuary, they will come near to the table, they will offer unto Yahweh the fat and the blood, they will stand before Yahweh to minister unto him, they will come near to minister unto Yahweh and as we've already seen, chapter 40 tells us that they will keep the charge of the altar. So two orders of priests with different functions and different responsibilities. Now what we need to bear in mind is that this arrangement is, as with everything else that we've been looking at relating to the temple, it's patterned upon the Mosaic priests of the Old Testament. Because when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, remember how it tells us that the tribe of Levi was selected by God 
for special service. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 8 that at that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister unto him and to bless in his name unto this day. So God selected the tribe of Levi, but then within the tribe of Levi, Aaron and his sons were selected to serve as priests. And they were the particular family, Aaron and his sons, from within the tribe of Levi that would stand before the Lord to minister to him. The rest of the tribe of Levi, well, they were to keep the charge of the tabernacle. <coughs> Now, you remember the, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan and Abiram that we read about in Numbers chapter 16. Now, now, this rebellion arose precisely because of this arrangement of the tribe of Levi. Because Korah, he was a, he was a son of Kohath of the tribe of Levi, but he wasn't a priest. So he was motivated by pride uh, and a desire to put himself forward and so what he did and with his co-conspirators they, it tells us that they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and they said unto him ye take too much upon you seeing we all the congregation are holy every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. So Korah was, was trying to take the priesthood, even though he wasn't a priest, he was just of the tribe of Levi. And so Moses said to him, in Numbers chapter 16, and verse 8, it says, Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren the sons of Levi with thee and seek ye the priesthood also. So this is what Korah was doing. He was seeking the priesthood. God had separated the tribe of Levi to stand before the congregation to minister unto them, but for Korah that wasn't enough. And we know what happened, the, the rebellion came to nothing when the earth swallowed them up and they, were, uh, they went down alive into the pit and their sympathizers were then destroyed in a plague. And afterwards, God spoke to Aaron, and again, he made it very clear what the arrangement of the priests and the Levites was to be. And it's in Numbers chapter 18, and verses 1 through to 5. And this is what God said after the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. The Lord said unto Aaron, Thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, Bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee. They shall keep thy charge and the charge of all the tabernacle. Only they shall not come nigh the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar, that neither they nor ye also die. And they shall be joined unto thee and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation. And ye, Aaron and his sons, shall keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, that there be no wrath any more upon the children of Israel. So can you see that this arrangement parallels exactly what we've got here in Ezekiel chapter 44. Under the Mosaic constitution, the tribe of Levi was entrusted with ministering to the congregation and the tabernacle, but they were not allowed to come near to the holy things. That was reserved for the sons of Aaron. Um, they were given the duty of keeping the charge of the altar. And, and what Ezekiel is telling us is that this arrangement will be just the same in the kingdom. 
Now, just come over to Isaiah chapter 66 because this is, there's a really helpful verse here in Isaiah 66 and we'll come back to this right at the end. Because what this tells us that this confirms for us that in the kingdom there will be this two-tier arrangement of priests in the age to come. Because speaking to speaking about the the future restoration of Israel, Isaiah says in verse 20, talking about the time when the Jews will return, it says, "They shall bring all your brethren." for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mount in Jerusalem saith the Lord as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord and then notice this and I will take of them that is of the children of Israel for priests and for Levites saith the Lord. So God is going to take of the restored, regathered children of Israel for priests and for Levites. Now this, this is an important verse and it has, it has an important bearing upon our identification of the sons of Zadok, who the sons of Zadok might be, as we shall see in a little while. <clears throat> so let's just go back now to Ezekiel chapter 44. So what we're going to think about first of all is the first order of priests, the keepers of the charge of the house. Uh, and what's clear is that this order of priests, the Levites, the keepers of the charge of the house, they will, in the kingdom, they will occupy a lower status than the sons of Zadok because they are not permitted to come near to any of the holy things and their ministry is going to be concerned with standing before the people to minister to the people and the detail of Ezekiel 40 verses 10 through to 14 explains why this is, why they, they will be less important in status in the kingdom. And the reason is because they are held responsible for the departure of the children of Israel from the worship of God in times past. Look what it says in verse 10. It says, And the Levites that are gone away far from me when Israel went astray, which went astray away from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. All right, so, so these are the Levites who caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity and to worship idols in generations past. And if we just think about Old Testament history for a while, we shall see that that is precisely what happened with the tribe of Levi. We've just seen now that God separated the Levites unto himself and he made with the priests a covenant of an everlasting priesthood and he gave them a particular responsibility to teach the children of Israel all the statutes and the judgments of God. But the history of the tribe of Levi from start to finish, with very few exceptions, was one of failure to, to discharge this responsibility. And the result was that the house of Israel went away into iniquity and they apostatized from the truth. And I'll, let's just go through one or two verses. So Isaiah 28 verse 7 um, says, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They're swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. 
Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Isaiah chapter 9, the leaders of this people cause them to err and they that are led of them are destroyed. Jeremiah chapter 50, my people have been lost sheep, their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They've turned them away on the mountains. They've gone from mountain to hill. They've forgotten their resting place. So this was, this was how Levi, the Levites, behaved. The leaders of the people caused them to err. And not only did the Levites fail to teach the statutes of God to the people, but there were occasions when they actively encouraged them in idolatry. So, for example, we've got um, the rather unsavoury story in Judges chapter 17 about the Levite from Bethlehem, Judah, who becomes personal priest to Micah, and he encourages him in the worship of his gods and, and we know that the outcome of that particular story was pretty disastrous. Um, in the days of Eli, his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they're described as sons of Belial and, and they were guilty of horrifying abuse of the sacrificial system to such a degree that, that men despised the offerings of God. In the days of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, that profane wicked prince of Israel, it tells us in Second Chronicles 36 that all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And, and then just finally, in the days of Ezekiel himself, the priests were guilty of violating God's laws. Ezekiel 22 says, her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They've put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and I've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. So, not a particularly illustrious history. And it was for this reason that eventually the, the, uh, the house of Israel was taken into captivity into Babylon. But even after the Babylonian captivity, when the exile returned to the land, even then, the, the priests failed in their responsibility of teaching the laws of God to the people. The priests had not even then learned that um, this was their responsibility, to teach the laws of God to the people. And so, in Malachi chapter 2, of course, Malachi is, is prophesying after the return of the exiles. He says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. The priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. You've caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. So this is the sad story of the, the tribe of Levi as depicted in the Old Testament. But the good news is that this is not going to remain so forever because later on in Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, the prophet tells us that the sons of Levi are going to be purified and purged as gold and silver. Malachi 3 verse 2 But who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap 
and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So this is, this is the good news, according to Malachi, that in the day of his coming, the Levites are going to be purified and purged. And this will come about as a result of the time of Jacob's trouble, the battle of Armageddon and the aftermath of that. And it's only then when the house of Israel has been humbled and when it learns to accept the, the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's only at that time that the tribe of Levi will finally be in a position to be reinstated as priests and to offer acceptable service to God. So God, God is going to take the tribe of Levi from amongst the re restored, regathered nation of Israel and they will serve as priests in the future age. Now clearly they will be mortal, won't they? Because the re restored, regathered nation of Israel, they're going to be the mortal population in the kingdom. And it's because of their poor record in, in ages past that they will only be permitted to do certain things in the temple. So if you have a look at Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 11, it says, Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house, and ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister unto them. So this is the tribe of Levi. They will stand before the people to minister to them. Verse 14 says, I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof and for all that shall be done therein. So that's what they will do. Verse 13 tells us what they will not be allowed to do. It says, they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. So although it says that they will slay the sacrifices, verse 11 says, so they slay the sacrifices for the people on the tables at the side of the north gate of the inner court. Once they've done that, once they've slain the sacrifices, their job will be finished and they will not be permitted to approach the altar. That duty, the duty of actually offering the sacrifices upon the altar, will be performed by the second order of priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar, otherwise known as the sons of Zadok. And we read about them in verse 15. It says, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me, to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. So it's pretty clear, isn't it, that the sons of Zadok, whoever they are, will occupy a much more important position than the Levites for this very reason that they kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me. So the question is, well, who are the sons of Zadok? Who do these sons of Zadok represent 
in the kingdom. And I think it will help us if we can sort of just understand a little bit about the genealogy of Zadok, who was the high priest in the days of David and Solomon. Now, you remember that Aaron had four sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar. And we know what happened to Nadab and Abihu. They died when they offered strange fire before God. And that left Eliezer and Ithamar, of whom Eliezer was the eldest. And so Eliezer became the high priest after the death of Aaron. And then after Eliezer, Phinehas, his son, became high priest. And so whilst both the houses of Eliezer and Ithamar were both priests, the high priest was originally in the line of Eliezer. But in the days of Samuel, we know that Eli was the high priest. Now he was of the line of Ithamar. And when David came to the throne, there appear to have been two high priests. There was Abiathar, who was of the line of Ithamar, and there was Zadok, who was of the line of Eleazar. And when David was on his deathbed, remember what happened, Abiathar conspired to make Adonijah king instead of Solomon. So there was this conspiracy and Abiathar was in on this conspiracy. Now Solomon of course had been divinely appointed. So Abiathar was part of this conspiracy whereas Zadok, well he remained faithful to, to David and to Solomon. And consequently, when Solomon eventually came to the throne, Abiathar was thrust out from being high priest and Zadok was put in his place. And we read about this in 1 Kings 2, verse 27, where it says that Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being, high, from being priest unto the Lord, that he might fulfil the word of the Lord, which he spake concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. And the king put Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, in his room over the host. And Zadok the priest did the king put in the room of Abiathar. And so this is the history. So in the matter of the royal succession, Zadok proved himself to be faithful to God. And it's appropriate because of this that his name, Zadok, means righteousness. So who are the sons of Zadok here in Ezekiel? Well, <clears throat> again, this is something that has been uh, the source of a lot of debate and discussion. And some people say that on the basis of the fact that Zadok proved himself to be a righteous man and will therefore, obviously, in the kingdom be raised from the dead and will receive the reward of everlasting life, some people suggest that the sons of Zadok here in Ezekiel 44 are a symbolic representation of the immortal saints in the kingdom who will reign with Christ as kings and priests. So this is a, this is a point of view that is put forward. Now, I'm going to try and show to you that that actually cannot be the case for a number of reasons and this is what we're going to look at now. Now, verse 17 down to the end of the chapter, verse 31, consists of a series of regulations that will govern the conduct of the priest in the age to come. And all of these regulations are designed to emphasize the importance of holiness and separation from uncleanness. Now, we're not going to look at them in detail, but it, th this is the list. So first of all, verse 17 through to 19, 
has to do with garments. So it says, when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and they shall not gird themselves with anything that causeth sweat. Regulation number two has to do with hair, verse 20. Neither shall they shave their heads. Number three has to do with the drinking of wine, which will be forbidden. Neither shall any priest drink wine. Number four, verse 22, has to do with wives. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that is put away, but they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a widow that had a priest before. So whoever these priests are, they can have wives under certain circumstances. Regulation number five has to do with teaching. This is, their, this is their duty. They shall teach my people the difference between holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. Revelation, uh, sorry, regulation six has to do with defilement by the dead which is not permitted, they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves. Regulation 7 is to do with their inheritance. God says, I am their inheritance, and ye shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. And the last regulation has to do with eating. Verse 31, the priest shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself or torn, whether it be fowl or beast. So these are the eight regulations that relate to the priests that are listed there for us in verses 17 down to the end. Now clearly, <clears throat> what we can conclude is that these regulations have to do with mortal men. Why do we say that? Well, because number one stipulates that they mustn't wear garments that cause sweat and regulation 4 relates to marriage and we know that the saints the immortal saints in the age to come will not marry because Jesus says so so these regulations have to relate to mortal men now those who say that the sons of Zadok are the saints what they have to do is to put verses 15 and 16 in brackets and say that verse 17 onwards goes back to discussing not the sons of Zadok but the, the Levites, the, the first order of priests. Okay, so, so that's the only way that you can make this chap, make the sons of Zadok to be the saints is to put verses 15 and 16 in brackets and then say that the regulations from verse 17 down to the end don't relate to the sons of Zadok, but they relate to the Levites. So the question is, is there any good reason for doing that, for putting verses 15 and 16 in brackets? And I think the answer to that is no. That the natural flow of the text would lead us to conclude otherwise, that these regulations relate to the sons of Zadok, but there's more than that. There are three good reasons which I'm going to show you for concluding that these regulations relate not to the Levites but to the sons of Zadok. Look at verse 17 first of all. <clears throat> it says there, that it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. Now, the Revised Version, with good reason there, says, instead of and within, says, and in the house. And the Hebrew word for within is the normal Hebrew word for house. 
That's important because what we've already established is that the Levites are not permitted into the house. That role is for the sons of Zadok, not the Levites. So that's the first little clue. Now verse 19 says that when they go forth into the utter court, even into the utter court to the people, they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered and lay them in the holy chambers and they shall put on other garments and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. So there's this rule about not sanctifying the people with the garments. They have to, when they go into the people, they have to take off one set of garments and they have to change into another. Now, just come back to chapter 42 because this chapter leaves us in no doubt that this regulation to do with garments applies not to the Levites but to the priests that approach unto the Lord. That is sons of Zadok because Ezekiel 42 verse 13 says then said he unto me the north chambers and the south chambers which are before the separate place they be holy chambers where the priests that approach unto the Lord so that's the sons of Zadok shall eat the most holy things there shall they lay the most holy things and the meat offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering for the place is holy when the priests enter therein they shall not go out of the holy place into the utter court but there they shall lay their garments wherein they minister for they they are holy and shall put on other garments and shall approach to those things which are for the people so this regulation to do with the changing of the garments pertains to the sons of Zadok, the priests that approach unto Yahweh, not to the Levites. Now, just come back to chapter 44 again. What we've seen is that the system of worship in the kingdom is going to be very much based upon the Mosaic system. And under the law of Moses, there were similarly two classes of Levites. There were the priests that were the sons of Aaron, and then there were the other members of the tribe of Levi. Now the interesting thing is that all of these regulations in Ezekiel 44 all feature in the law of Moses. And they apply not to the Levites, but to the sons of Aaron. Okay, in every single case, there's some references there on the screen. All of these regulations, without exception, are found in the law of Moses and they relate not to the Levites generally, but specifically to the sons of Aaron, to the priests. And therefore, I would suggest that it's logical to apply them in Ezekiel, not to the Levites, but to the sons of Zadok. Now, regulation number eight, which has to do with the eating of the meat offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering, and the receiving of the first fruits from the house of Israel. Look at verse uh, Ezekiel 44 and verse 29. It says, They shall eat the meat offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering and every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. And the first of all the first fruits of all things and every oblation of all of every sort of your oblations shall be the priests. You shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. So this regulation concerning eating to do with the eating of the meat offering, the sin offering and the trespass offering and the receiving of the first fruits and the oblations has to do with the priests here. Now the question is which priests? Well if there's any doubt 
that these regulations relate to the priests under the law of Moses and not the, law, not the Levites generally, then this verse dispels it altogether. Because under the law of Moses, it was only the priests that ate of these holy things, not the Levites. So, for example, the meat offering, Leviticus 6 tells us, this is the law of the meat offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord, before the altar, and the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat. All the males among the children of Aaron shall eat of it. So the meat offering under the law of Moses was eaten not by the Levites, only by Aaron and his sons. And so it was for the sin offering, Leviticus chapter 6. This is the law of the sin offering. The priest that offereth it for sin shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten, in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation, all the males among the priests shall eat thereof. It is most holy. And the same is true for the trespass offering. Likewise, this is the law of the trespass offering. Leviticus 7 says, every male among the priests shall eat thereof. All the sons of Aaron, one as much as another. <clears throat> what about receiving the first fruits? Numbers 18, again, tells us the same thing. The Lord spake unto Aaron, this is thine, the heave offering of their gift with all the wave offerings of the children of Israel. All the first fruits belonged to Aaron and his sons. And the same is true with the receiving of the oblations. Numbers 18, verse 11. The Lord spake unto Aaron, Behold, I also have given thee the charge of mine heave offerings of all the hallowed things of the children of Israel. Unto thee have I given them by reason of the anointing and to thy sons by an ordinance for ever. And, and the Hebrew word for oblations here in Ezekiel 44 it is the same word as translated heave offerings there. So the heave offerings in Numbers 18 are the same thing as the oblations in Ezekiel 44. So I think we've got to conclude from this that the regulations in Ezekiel 44 verses 17 through to the end apply to the sons of Zadok, not the Levites. And therefore, we also have to conclude that the sons of Zadok will be mortal. They will be mortal descendants of Zadok, I believe, in the kingdom, who will fulfill the duty of priests in the sanctuary. And I think that's what that verse from Isaiah 66 is talking about that we looked at at the beginning, when to do with the restored, regathered nation of Israel, God says of them, I will take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. <clears throat> and just one last reference, Jeremiah 33. Again, teaches us the same thing. Look what Jeremiah says here. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, If ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant, <coughs> and the Levites, that minister unto me. Of course we know, don't we, that day and night will never cease. And therefore we can conclude that God's covenant with the Levites, the priests, will not be broken forever. And this is what I think Ezekiel 44 
he's talking about. Right, we could possibly do with one more study where what we need to do is try and um, <coughs> fit the sanctuary into the land, okay, and because uh, we've got quite a lot of geographical information in Ezekiel about the boundaries of the land, how the land is going to be divided up into the amongst the 12 tribes and then there's a special piece of land in the middle called the Holy Oblation which is where the temple will be. So we could perhaps do with one more session on that and also we need to look at the river that uh, Ezekiel sees in chapter 47.